We the, the legends, legends of the stoop. stoop. We're here to advocate, Stoop. educate, and inspire society. Stoop. Coming at you live from the South Side. Welcome back to Legends of the Stoop. I am your host, Mike Pernice. Today's episode is brought to you by Follow the Trees, Ride the Vibe. Use our promo code, hashtag StoopLegends, at checkout through to see discounts on all CBD products and merchandise. Today, the Stoop is doing something a little different. You know, we like to diversify here. It is an open mic platform. Um, therefore, I have my good friend, Anthony, on set. Um, we're actually going to be discussing Edmund Spencer's The Fairy Queen. Um, we'll get into a little bit further exactly what our topic is um, here shortly. But, yeah, this is just something new. Um, you know, may or may not continue. We'll see. But, uh how you doing? How are we doing? Good, good to see you. Nice to see you. Thank you for having me. Appreciate yeah, it. Absolutely. You know, it's a, uh, who else would I rather work on my final project with in my, in our last, like last in the classroom, like semester. That's it. Yeah. So it's been a long, strange trip. <sighs> yeah. Especially <laughs> the last two semesters. Yeah, for sure. For sure. For sure. The strangest, uh, for everyone in yeah. the country and the world. Yeah. But uh, doesn't make it any less impactful for us. No, that's for sure. I mean, it's definitely, I don't know about you, but I'm definitely feeling like the Zoom fatigue at this point. Oh, yeah. Discussion boards, bro. No, I'm done. I've been I'm done with it. screaming into a screen for the past eight months. <laughs> that's all I've been doing. Right, the Zoom fatigue, is that what you called it? Yeah. I like it. Yeah, dude. It's just like, dude, my Monday, like, just like, I typically don't mind evening classes like i've taken a lot of night classes sure and so have you i've right. been a lot of them together yeah um but just like that like late night like i'm in my room and it's like eight eight o'clock and like we're just getting off mm-hmm. a zoom call and i'm just like i just listened to two lectures like back back to back, back. from three from to three nine. nine yep and i'm just done Beat. like i can't do homework like my, my i need like my eyes hurt yep my head hurts like just from like you know sitting there and like just, focusing on the screen all just gonna day. turn the light off for a second yeah. <laughs> just close the laptop like i can't right. do it and i didn't even have a laptop up until um i know this man used up to until work August. on his phone this right here and just the i would write like, full paper labs yeah, yeah i would i would jump into uh like a canavan computer lab and college uh college hall computer lab yeah. and we that's that's where i spent a lot of time because I didn't have a laptop, yeah. uh, but I was lucky enough and unlucky enough that my wedding was postponed and my honeymoon was then postponed. So I was able to use a little bit of the honeymoon fund mm. to purchase uh, this laptop. This whole thing is just, it, the whole thing meaning the pandemic and the stay at home and the quarantine and all that has just further proven that there is a giant disparity between the haves and the have nots in this country. And yeah, like, for sure. The, the haves didn't really have any issues you know they were able to work from home and their kids could then be in school at home and it wasn't you know it wasn't a huge uh disruptor right i mean don't get me wrong it was disruptive for everyone literally on the planet but it was a lot easier of a transition for certain people than it was for others yeah for sure um i wouldn't have spent the i don't know 800 dollars on this laptop if it wasn't if it wasn't for this i wouldn't have genuinely because I made it through three years on my phone, and I was able to do that, yeah. uh, and it worked out pretty well. Well, I guess that's kind of what Spencer was doing with Fairy Queen. You how, know what I mean? how so? How so? Like, I mean, if you think about it, like, so we're going to, like, the first segment we'll get into here is just, like, women's role in the 16th century, and just in general, um, and then we'll touch upon uh, Spencer's, like, portrayal of women within the Fairy Queen. And like you know, this representation between like Elizabeth um, first, but um, in terms of like fixing things, like you know, the Fairy Queen he uses as like a critique, basically of the 16th century gender roles um, within England society, um, and this is like pretty evident, um, 
within the text. Mm -hmm. But as you'll see, like we'll draw upon um, several scholarly articles, but then also backer claims as we would typically do in our essay. Yeah. You know, this is basically an oral essay. Yeah. <laughs> A group oral essay because that's what the pandemic has done to higher education. <laughs> Put us all in the fetal position. Yeah. Um, but, like, basically what I want to do is just, like, start off um, with just, like, quoting um, this article that we have pulled up. Um, it's uh, James D. Bell's uh, Gender Obedience Authority in the 16th Century Women's Letters. Um, so, basically, James D. Um, D. Bell's article um, goes ahead and analyzes letters of 16th century women. Mm -hmm. um, and these letters were written to both men and women of different like power levels within like England society. Mm -hmm. um, and they go about, and when they're analyzing the letters, they're specifically looking at things such as like the language they use, the form, um, and then the modes of address. So basically these things dictate whether or not um, this person is acting in either an aggressive um, mentality mm -hmm. um, through like letter exchange so either from the person sending or receiving but then also through that mode of address they're able to like identify where these people are portrayed within the power level you know what I mean yeah. so like obviously like if you're referring to the queen like you're gonna dress it up versus like sure if you're just talking I don't know maybe to your father it's gonna be on a level that's like slightly less formal Unless um, evidence has shown um, it was typical for young women um, to typically address the father as in a um, like weakened state. Like a submissive, yeah. demure kind of yeah, kind of, uh, sense. Yeah. Sure, that makes sense. Um, for the time. Yeah. For the record. For the, for the time. <laughs> makes yeah, sense for, sure. for, the, for the time. Yeah, like if we, if we didn't specify this as like 16th century um, England. Um, so the gender roles are obviously drastically different yes. <laughs> from today. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, what's kind of like your take in terms of like where women were at in this time period, um, you know, just like overall? Well, they were seen mostly as, like we said, submissive to their male counterparts. Um, women were not educated or were not educated well, mm -hmm. um, but the boys were. Um, like, sisters to brothers weren't, but the brothers were. Right. Um, they were for child-bearing, child-rearing purposes to have sons, basically. Um, only men could uh, own land, mm -hmm. and that was sort of the, the note of, of prominence in England uh, right. at that time and throughout history in general oh, land ownership is kind of your your ticket to social mobility yeah and, and women could only achieve social mobility through marriage yeah um and even then you wouldn't see someone who was in the in the lower lowest class marrying like a lord of some kind you wouldn't really see that because lords would marry ladies and lower class people, women would could only go up a right. step. It, they weren't going to skip several steps. So for the most part, women were seen as this um, secondary figure. Uh, however, we have seen through our studies and through just the historical, historical context, uh, women are smart and strong and right. can be uh, can be the hero, the heroine. Um, in their own story, uh, but it, society was not in their favor in yeah. that regard. Well, and there's definitely a shift from when, like, before Elizabeth takes the throne. Sure. And then during, and then thereafter, like, this, like, movement that she started. Yeah. And, you know, it's kind of interesting um, when we're talking about how Spencer, you know, in this, like, his portrayal on women was almost the one where it's like I don't generally know if he is being like for lack of a better term like a smart ass sure 
You know what I mean? Sure. And just like, like I'm gonna point something out for you. Yep. But I'm gonna make you, the reader, determine whether or not like this is like this woman should have this like right of power. Yep. Like this much authority. Yeah. You know what I mean? So it's like I don't really like as we go on. I feel like I'll we're, we'll be able to build upon this. Yeah. Um, idea like I have a pretty good. Um, hypothesis that I'm like kind of sitting on right now don't tease me now (laughs) um but you know it's I just like I just thought it was interesting to see this like grip of not only just like women within the time period but then also like this role that women play as like female knight characters yeah Britta Mart yeah I think is the the first uh the main name that comes to mind is that she's a female knight right and she kicks major ass like, she is the real deal. Um, and even, like, uh, Mrs. Steal Your Girl at, at one point. <laughs> it's like, she, there may have been some some female-female loving going on with yeah. Britta Mart because, you know, she was, she I don't know how else to put it, but she was, like, that dude. Yeah. She, she was the knight. Yeah. You know, we think of Red Cross as the knight, but in reality, Britta Mart was, like, the knight. Uh, and and uh, an absolute heroine, an absolute just star. Uh, and I think, what was it, Elizabeth ruled for 45 years, something yeah. like that. And in that time, you're right, uh, the, the role of women or the perception of women uh, changed, I wouldn't say drastically, but it changed enough to the point where women could be seen as strong individuals mm-hmm. and not just uh, demure maidens. Yeah. I think is yeah just like housewives yeah you know um so it's like bringing up since you brought up Britta Mart I want to refer to um Mary I'm gonna butcher her name Bill Ponix sure um anyways her article is uh displacing feminine authority within the fairy queen uh and she goes ahead and like she suggested Britta Mart who you stated um represents or like reflects like Queen Elizabeth Mm -hmm. um basically is used as a way for Spencer to display his uncertainty of women's role within a society where masculine men traditionally hold power. Right. Um, basically, she's insisting that that the only reason that this exists is because men were in charge of, like, creating the laws of their society. Yeah. So, obviously, when you're creating like when you're the one creating the laws like and there's no other representation from any like other like minority group like you're going to be able to control your society and like dictate people's positions however you want them to be right you know what i mean it's like you're turning everybody else into a pawn in your own game of society yeah and we see that all the way from then all the way through history um up through modern day Mm -hmm. um i mean the Constitution of the United States wasn't signed by any women or people of color. Uh, you know what I mean? Yeah. And it's, yeah, you know, true. the 1960s, late 60s is when pretty much everyone in this country got the right to vote. Yeah. Um, so that's, you know, like that, this isn't a new concept. Yeah. Um, when you make the rules, you tend to make them for yourself. And that's, uh, that's something that we definitely saw in Spencer's time. And that's why I think Elizabeth played such a heavy role uh, in in this, in the Fairy Queen. Yeah. And, you know, it's kind of like, I saw what Spencer was trying to do for Elizabeth mm-hmm. um, through, like, this, the, through, like, following Britta Mart's, like, journey throughout the, throughout the text. Yeah. And it was, like, he's trying to in essence, what I got was, like, basically break her away from this uh, gene, genealogy, well, um, I think I'm butchering that word, genealogy, I don't know, genealogy, no, no, not genealogy, it's, um, 23 me, I don't know, generosyncrasy, okay, yeah yeah that one yeah you get me i got you get me yeah we'll get there yeah all right so basically (laughs) uh genius secrecy 
is like basically he's breaking Elizabeth away from this, and this is represented by the part in which he, um, like uh, Britomart looks into Merlin's looking glass, mm-hmm. like that enchanted mirror, and she. A lot of people like a lot of critics are saying that. I mean, well, it's even in the text, but that like when she sees, um, yeah, what's his name? That's what her name. Arth- Arthigal. We know Britomart is a reflection of Elizabeth. Yes. To an extent, though. Yeah. Because she loses her chastity. And Elizabeth is known as the the chaste queen. She's right. The... That's where Elizabeth draws her power from her chastity. Yes. Where Britomart is perceived to draw her power through her chastity, mm-hmm. but she's really just a fucking kick-ass knight. Yeah, like she's just super dope. Yeah, okay. so in in this in this part right here in Book 3, Canto 2, uh, Section 3, it states, of warlike uh, possidence in ages spent, be thou fair Britomart, whose praise I write, but of all the wisdom, be thou president, or precedent. Precedent. Yeah. It's close. There you go. Oh, sovereign queen, whose praise I would indict. So what she's doing here is, like, basically, Spencer is differentiating Britomart from uh, Elizabeth right. in this essence where it's saying, like, Britomart is, like, it says right there, warlike, like she is a knight. Yeah. Where, you know what I mean? So she does have the ability to just like be a knight. Yeah. Not necessarily pulling her power. Her power doesn't necessarily come from her being Chaz. Like it comes from the fact that she's a female knight. Yeah. And who is it? It's an authoritarian like figure and yeah. mentality. And people didn't like that about elizabeth yeah. and this is why she was perceived she took on this like motherly approach mm-hmm. where she used the court to appease the country sure. right and this is why we saw so much progression within like these gender roles within society yeah is all because of this difference in which women gain their power and like their authoritarian status yeah and Britomart, like, one of the first times we see her, she gets attacked by two, like, yeah, two henchmen or whatever. Yeah. And she just beats them up. Right. With very little problem. Yeah. And she right. also unseats a uh, fucking um, golem. Yeah. So, yeah. I mean, like, in an essence, I mean, so sh- that's, like, like I said, like, that even furthers, like, our point in which Britomart, yes, she does reflect, like, Elizabeth in a point but I think she represents this um, this like divide between Elizabeth and the junior secrecy that is alluded to through Marilyn's looking glass that relates to the Egyptian the fall of the Egyptian towers yeah and um, if you give me one second um, it's right here in the article. Uh, yeah, it's right here in the, it's actually in the same article that I was already quoting uh, Mary Vilponux. Um, Vilpon 2. Yeah. Oh, that looks right. So basically, it's saying. Um, Right here, in order, all right, so Spencer excuses Elizabeth from the junior secrecy of, um, I'm going to butcher the names again, but Penthesilia and Deborah, who are these, like, valorized women warriors, Mm -hmm. right? And they're depicted in book three, Canto four, Um, but Spencer excuses Elizabeth from this by undermining Britomart's like heroic warrior and emphasizing her like pure chastity and virtue is rare as it's quoted here um, in order to accommodate the stanza's culmination in Elizabeth. Yeah. So what does this really mean? It just means that Spencer 
is like portraying Bridgemar in a neg- in a negative light when she is acting in a like masculine authoritarian figure. Okay. Like within any scene of the book, and I feel like that's why she's withdrawn so much. It's an interesting take. It's a really interesting take. I like it. I also want to bring up the fact that that spear mm-hmm. uh, is a phallic object. Okay. And I don't think that should be overlooked. And maybe I'm maybe I'm pulling, mm-hmm. um, but it seems like a lot of power comes from phallic objects in the Fairy Queen: swords, spears, um, even trees. You know what I mean? Well, if you compare it to like Beowulf, for example, sure. I mean, there's a lot of weapons there too. So I wonder if it's a pull from that same period. Yeah, I mean, we, because that wouldn't that was was Beowulf was Beowulf written in, in like around the same or like I wonder if there was like a relation between Beowulf and like Chaucer since like you know Chaucer influences Spencer. Yeah, Beowulf was like an epic poem. Yeah, so that was written like that was a, yeah that a was long, a long time, ago. time ago. Yeah, yeah, um, but. I have no doubt that Chaucer would know it. Yeah. Uh, and it's just like, you, men, male writers tend to write power in phallic objects. Mm-hmm. Uh, famous. That's why. Like, <laughs> that's why. Like, let's just call a spade a spade. You yeah. Know, it's, uh, a spade is also, a, anyway. But, <laughs> so I don't, I don't think that should be ignored. And later on, when we talk about um, violent acts uh, in particular, yeah. There's going to be a phallic object involved. Surprise, surprise. So, and uh, like you said, he's, you know, Spencer's kind of a smart ass. Yeah. We learned that uh, if you read the, um, what is it, the calendar? Shepherd's, Shepherd's calendar. calendar. If you read the Shepherd's calendar, um, really, if you read any of the Fairy Queen, it's just, it's always like he's showing you he's smarter than you. Mm-hmm. And it's frustrating. Yeah. Um, but it's, it's a good read because it keeps you thinking and it keeps you, it keeps you guessing. Like people can say that, oh, Brittamore was actually seeing herself as article. Um, and we know that Spencer's not afraid to make different characters, different people, mm-hmm. or to put, uh, to put Arthur in a million different uh, stories, even though none of them are really connected. Right. So it's, you know, he's, he's always sort of flexing his literary muscles. Um, and, and I think he's, he kind of is just sort of a douche. Um, but a very, very talented dude. A very talented dude. <laughs> and then just to, just sort of to put a nail uh, in the coffin of Elizabeth's uh, overall uh, influence on society at that time, mm-hmm. um, in the article which we have up here entitled Female Education in 16th and 17th Century England by Miriam Balmuth, uh, it, it talks about how, uh, Elizabeth really pushed for the education of, of young women, mm-hmm. and um, there was the movement of the Protestant reformers, reformers and um, humanism, and a big proponent of this in England, and then eventually in America, was a man named Richard Mulcaster, okay. uh, and Richard Mulcaster was the, he was the most prominent proponent of educating women not just in the upper class, but throughout uh, the caste system, mm-hmm. basically. So a, a quote that we can pull from here is actually a quote from Richard Mulcaster himself. Uh, it, it, when asked, why should we, you know, educate women, basically, yeah. was the question. And why should we educate women of all social classes? The quote is, our country doth allow it, our duty doth enforce it, their aptness calls for it, their excellency commands it. And I think that is just a beautiful way of saying they're people too. They're just as smart as us. Yeah. They're, they're just as quick and as clever and they're just as apt as we are. And uh, for those reasons, there's no reason to not educate them. Yeah. And I feel like also too, he's arguing that like, by saying like our country doth allow our, our duty and forces, mm-hmm. like if we don't do this, then like this can like prevent, like cause mm-hmm. like a crack in our foundation yeah yeah you know you're, I mean? you're doing a disservice to your country right. um as as we know and the reason we've chosen education is because we believe every 
person should be educated. Right. Because a well informed society is a well working, well oiled machine. You yeah. I hate to think about a country as a machine, but <laughs> it's it's true that when you have a well informed society, when you have a knowledgeable society, you can progress faster. You can yeah. progress more. And there's no reason to hold back this whole group just because they were born with different genitals than this group. That just doesn't make any sense. Right. And I think Molecaster, uh, who was heavily influenced by Elizabeth, uh, is is saying that, you know, they they are good to go. They can do this. Right. There's no reason not to. They can help us. Right. And you're holding back the country by not educating them. For so, sure. Uh, I think that's that's a nice, I hate to use a man, t- a man's quote to wrap up uh, Elizabeth Elizabeth's influence, <laughs> but if there was anyone who would be against it, it would be this old white man. He would be against, you know, educating uh, poor women yeah. because he wants to keep them in a complacent and a submissive role. But he's so in, in, inspired by Elizabeth that you know he's a huge he's a huge proponent of it. Right, and you know it's funny you mentioned like this like shift too. Because um, back in, like, Dave Bell's article, mm-hmm. um, he states that um, the letters, uh, and this is a direct quote, shed significant light on the nature of women's uh, social relationships and their complex position within a social and gendered um, hierarchical society where codes of female obedience and authority were set in constant tension to one another. Um therefore basically this like masculine theory of power within england should not be considered as like the sole blueprint sure. for this nation anymore sure you know what i mean like it's time to expand and to adapt a new way of thinking yep just taking things by force isn't the only way to do things and you can you can still progress um and build without having to kill people right so I dig it. I wish more people thought like that still, but <laughs> um, here we are. What do you say we move on to our, I guess what we really did segment one and two there. Yeah. Um, so what, what do you say we move on to segment three? Um, Spencer's portrayal of women um, in the Fairy Queen. Um, I don't know. I, I guess like I, I kind of touched upon this. Both of us like kind of touched upon this already. Mm-hmm. It's just like you don't really know if he's genuinely like doing this out of the goodness of like his heart, you know what I mean? Yeah. Or whether he's just like doing it to kind of be like an asshole, you know? Um, but I thought it was interesting that, um, played Ford's article, um, the women in Spencer's allegory of love basically went, went ahead and examined, the female characters, um, specifically like Emma, LPB, um, Florimel, Rajan, Rajan, Red, Rajanda, Redigand, Redigand. Yeah, they're weird names. Yeah. they're yeah. strange names. And Bridgemore. I've I've made a I've made a personal goal to say as few out loud as possible. <laughs> it's very. Difficult. It's so hard because like there is so many characters to keep track of. Yeah. Um. You know, like, the plot maps were definitely a big help. Oh, yeah. Those were a big help this semester. Oh, yeah. I will say. Even though they gave me a migraine looking at them. (laughs) My eyes crossed. Dude, your last one was ridiculous. Your last one was ridiculous. I should have counted how many squares there were. (laughs) I think it was was the biggest. That had to be the biggest plot map. It was. It was. It was mentioned um, that we should try to switch out of it. (laughs) <laughs> and that was the right I suggestion remember that leaving class one yeah, yeah that was the right suggestion i sh- we should have tried to switch out of it but we did it it's done it's fine it's everything's cool i'm not twitching at all <laughs> everything's fine um so this like concept basically of like spencer's allegory of love mm-hmm. and the characters in which he um go ahead or in which held for go ahead and analyzes for us um, basically give this um, sense that like Spencer's theory of love constructs a society in which like these masculine men are um, 
like love women who are modest and like submissive um and like we see this a lot and as we'll touch upon later through this like act of aggression um but i just like wanted to get like your take on like what characters i guess like kind of like were pointed out like to you i guess um aramet is the first one or uh, uh, amaret again i don't like to say it (laughs) a-m-o-r-e-t (laughs) <laughs> on the right i don't know she is the first one that like really comes out and sticks out to mind because she was uh, stolen by her husband in the first place mm-hmm. and again we're, we're going to touch on this in the next uh, in the next section but like she literally was just like ye and just taken right. and and then was taken again and it's literally like she was just uh she was a hat that people liked and they took that hat when they wanted it yeah. So a- Amaret is is like the, it's just so sad, it's, and again she's the main she's the main um, the, the, the topic in, in the next section. So I don't want to talk too much on her, but she's something that like really bothers me. It's like damn, she was just trying to live her life, and yeah. the, the men just kept taking her. Um, also, um, was it Floramel that was just like good looking? So all yeah. the men thought that she was... It was her beauty. Yeah. yeah that she, like, drew, like, her power on, I yeah. guess we could so say. Yeah, so all the men thought that, like, she, she... They all fell in love with her. And then right. and then they would turn into just absolute jerks because she was like, no thanks. Yeah. Um, not to mention... Oh, uh, oh, goodness. Who is it? Who is it? Um, what's, uh, what's the... What's the name? Mirabella. Mirabella. Mirabella, again, is uh, coming up the next section, so I'll give a little teaser. Mirabella did nothing wrong except for be super good-looking and say no thank you to a bunch of guys. Yeah. That was it. Mirabella was just like, no, I'm good. Yeah. I mean, there was some colorful poetry that Spencer threw in there about how, but for the most part, she was just, like, gorgeous, and right. men liked her, and she was just not interested. Yeah. And then they killed themselves, like, and then they died. So... Yeah. In reality, it's like, well, what what did you want her to do? She couldn't say no to, or she couldn't say yes to all of them. Right. So should she have said yes to the first, and then the other twenty two would have left her alone? Or if she would have said yes to the fifth, would she be, you know, in trouble for the first four that died after she turned them down? I don't know. Yeah. So it's just like, what are we doing, Eddie? You know, what what are we doing? <laughs> I don't I don't quite understand what we're going for. So yeah, I think those are those are the, the women that are sort of. Demi- I mean, Brittemar's the exact opposite, where she's, like, masculine and strong and um, also good-looking. I think that was mentioned. There, I don't know if there are any ugly women in this in this story. <laughs> not that I can really remember. No. Uh, not, that, not that any that come to mind right away. So it's, like, uh, Spencer was... I don't, I don't know if he was writing super in-depth female characters or if he was just writing super in-depth characters that happen to be female. Let's talk real quick about Floramel and uh, Belle Phoebe and their relation to Elizabeth. Cool. Okay. Yeah. Because we already touched upon Brittemard's. We like, talked, yeah, we talked about how Brittemard is, yeah. you know, sort of a reflection of her to some extent. Right. Uh, but main role is to break her from the junior sequency. Yeah. Um, yeah. All right. So hit me. Well, how do we feel, how do we feel about uh, Floramel's sort of chastity or are we, or do we think it's more um, Belle Phoebe's chastity, 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 yeah, chaste nature? Uh, <laughs> how do do we feel like um, one is more chaste than the other, and then that that would then reflect Elizabeth more? Um, or do yeah. we think what well, what are our thoughts there? Well, I would I would say that Belle Phoebe is. She's the queen of chastity, right? Okay. Like she's she or she embodies chastity and the queen's pursuit of it. Okay. Where I would say Flormel is like this embodiment of beauty and beauty's power. Okay. Versus you know Belle Phoebe's power of chastity, um, which we've said earlier, Brittemar loses. Because Brittemar obviously gets married and has kids, um, which is kind of seen as like a 
kind of like slap them in the face, kind of like a, you know, like a cough, cough to the queen, like saying mm-hmm. like, hey, you could have, you know, built the next like it, like heir to the throne, sure. like you know, you could have produced the next heir to the throne. Yeah. Um, but you chose not to. Um, so I think we see Formel basically use her beauty to project power, um, and Belphoebe to use chastity, um, to project her power. Sure. So Formel is more of like a maternal. Yeah, she's motherly. Yeah, figure. she's Queen Elizabeth's like projection out to society. Like Queen Elizabeth, like I said earlier, took on this like motherly, like nature, you know, like role where she just wanted to appease her society. Sure. Um. So yeah, I feel like that's where, like, I feel like that's a like a rep- representation of Formel. So so far we have Queen Elizabeth being represent represented by Britomart, by Formel, by Belphoebe. Mm-hmm. Um. Do we think there's a female character in this book that doesn't have some mirroring to Elizabeth? Or do we think um, they all represent some side of her, public or private? Um, I would say that this text generally, I think, is a critique slash praise of Elizabeth Mm -hmm. and the anxiety in which she governed I think that's like if I could if I could like really make it as broad as as I could Mm -hmm. as a concept um that's the concept that I would choose um to label the fairy queen um you know it's like there's this nature in which Spencer uses violence right to depict, which is depicted, like, through either the character's involvement um, and or reaction to that scene that involves the violence that is juxtaposed to the gender roles within the 16th century society. Um, So I think, like, what we're kind of, like, getting ourselves into is the fact that when you induce scenes of violence there always seems to be in the narrative of the fairy queen this like abrupt like shift in the point of the narrative Mm -hmm. um typically in it's like to me kind of reflects that like masculine like power authority and just being like you know taking the reins of like the progression of society and just like pulling them backwards sure you know what i mean so, like, that's where I feel, like, when we're talking about, like, Spencer's overall, like, just, like, his thoughts and feelings on women, I just, like, I, I generally think that once we go ahead and discuss this fourth segment, mm-hmm. I think you're really going to see the fact that Spencer is not an advocate, in my opinion, for women's rights. I think he is somebody who recognizes that there is a problem, but I don't think he actually addresses how to fix that problem. So he's more of a critic type of role. Sure, sure. He, I I do think it's it's important to know um, how many different characters he chooses to reflect a different side of uh, of Elizabeth. And in Paddleford's uh, essay, um, article, academic literature, The Women in Spencer's Allegory of Love, there's a quote that I think really sort of condenses all of the, all of the sides of Elizabeth that are present here. Mm-hmm. Um, it will be apparent that Amoret is made the special embodiment of grace and charm, Belphoebe of chastity, and Flormel of beauty. And that's uh, if if Spencer is not a is not a um, proponent of or is not pushing for more women's rights and uh, more equal gender roles, um, he is at the very least uh, on bended knee in front of Elizabeth, um, at least in this regard, saying, you know, you're pretty great. And, yeah. Well, I mean, 
I think we might have touched upon this already, um, or this might have just been in our pre-discussion to shooting this, was the fact that like Spencer is like in in this in the 16th century it's all about like how you were saying like land owning yeah you know the way you dress the the way you present yourself right like those are the things that were deemed important and i think this critique is really just spencer like begging for this approval from the queen sure you know what i mean sure. like let me ascend up to yep. your level you know i can what I mean be, like i can be the chaucer of this generation right i can be i can be the guy yeah basically for sure like he he wants to be like this like grand protagonist mm -hmm. for um england yeah you know what i mean yes he, he wants to be the hero of england he wants to be the the li literary hero of england basically yeah. of his time so I, it makes sense that he would suck up to the queen yeah for sure oh. Zoom. So we've been talking a lot about basically like the representation of like Queen Elizabeth mm -hmm. through several characters um, within the Fairy Queen. Um, so I want to draw upon Susan Wood's article, um, Spencer and the Problem of the Woman's Role. Uh, so basically, she argues that like Spencer reveals um, his thoughts on women's role in society in book three, Canto Two, like right at the very beginning. Um, he notes that. Um, men refuse to credit women with any, like, prowess morale, or prowess, um, prowess, prowess, you help marital, me. marital, yeah, thank you, more or less, yeah, um, nor do they allow them any, like, share in arms and chivalry, so basically, um, she's arguing that Woods, or I'm sorry, that Spencer, um, challenges the role of women within the 16th century society, um through like his um like poetic choice to use Britomart. Because like we see Britomart like periodically throughout the text, sure. but never just like you would expect the main character to be in the majority of the cantos, or I believe she's in like half, if not maybe less. Oh yeah. If I'm not mistaken. Yeah. Um but anyways, so like this like this action of him, like, you know, pull, putting her in and then pulling her back out kind of thing basically is a representation of when he is, like, contradict, like, making contradictory statements on women's rule within the 16th century. Sure. No, that makes sense. I mean, he's, uh, I think, though, going back to a point you made earlier, maybe he is offering a, a solution. Let women do the same thing men do because – they can. Yeah. Britta Mort is a prime example that, you know, anything you can do, I can do better. You know, Britta Mort is, is that doing it better. Yeah. Okay. So maybe, I don't know, but it's it's hard to tell exactly what he meant by certain things because he does write with the arrogance. Yeah. Um, and I, I, I'm showing my bias here. I, I I like his writing, but sometimes it makes me mad. No. Sometimes Sometimes it's like stop it you're doing too much you're 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 being like you're just being arrogant right now it's, right it's it's written with an i'm smarter than you attitude yeah for sure um what do you say we move into segment four sure that we've been alluding to um which is basically i feel like we've built it up so much that yeah, it's gonna it's like basic i would say it's it's the it's the backbone of our argument sure i would say so Sure. I'd say it's the backbone. No pressure. <laughs> no pressure at all. Just um, weigh it all on this last 15-ish minutes. Yeah, I mean, it's fine. It's all right, right? Um, well, I don't think we can talk about, um, I don't think we can talk about violence in this, uh, in, in this um, book, or we can't talk about violence against women in this book without talking about Mirabella. Okay. And Mirabella, as I alluded to before, um, was just super good looking and really nice, mm -hmm. except for she didn't want these men. And these men then um, died <laughs> after she said, no, no, thank right. you. Um, so Mirabella, Mirabella uh, was brought and tried in front of the court of Cupid. Okay. Uh, and 
Spencer's text, and this comes from the article Spencer's Ravish. No, it's not. This comes from Mirabella's Crime and the Laws of Love and the Fairy Queen by, oh goodness, Danila Sokolov. <laughs> oh my gosh. The, um, names, the names, man. Uh, the names. <laughs> so this comes from Sokolov or Sokolov? I don't know. It's probably Russian. And uh, this states Spencer's sex suggests that Mirabella's actions can be also misconstrued as murder, which translates her trans- transgression into the language of the common law of felony. So basically, what that's saying is um, by Mirabella turning down these men and then, then them dying, she is on the hook for their murder. Mm-hmm. Uh, and when you, when you put that into like a court, even though it's the court of Cupid, which is sort of fantastical, um, it makes it very real for the reader. You know, they can picture a courtroom, they can picture, you know, how, how that would look. Right. Uh, even if the guy on the bench has an, an arrow and yeah, wings, yeah. right? So, um, and then I just I re- I want to read this quote and bear with me. It's a little it's a little lengthy. Yeah, no, no go but for the it. it's it's really to hammer home that she was just like good looking and a little arrogant. And this is right out of the text too. Right, right, out, of, right out of book six. Yes, directly out of book six. So Mirabella was decked with wondrous gifts of nature's grace which did kindle a lowly fire in the hearts of many a knight and many a gentle squire. But the beautiful lady grew proud and insolent, scorned them all that low unto her meant. Uh, their deaths, so then, then they, you know, they, their deaths all like sort of get noticed on uh, St. Valentine's Day, which mm-hmm. again, Cupid's day. Right. Um, so Cupid goes through the rows in which the names of all the loves folks were flied or filed uh, <laughs> and then he discovers that a lot of his uh, subjects are missing um, quote unquote dead or kept in bands or from their loves exiled or by some other violence despoiled um, Cupid then goes into this sort of like legality of it all okay. and the, the word directly from the text is violence book 6 uh, canto 7 page 33 to be exact violence he cupid and then by in turn spencer is equating uh mirabella going no thanks and maybe she was a little shitty about it maybe you know but he's equating that to a violent act of murder oh well, yeah because i mean there's also like this you gotta remember like if we're comparing it to like how we've been comparing everything to to like the actual like historical concept like of this novel mm-hmm. in the 16th century is like women don't have that right sure or should not right have that right what right you have to turn me down right woman yeah like like going back to our argument of just like that submissive mm-hmm. state you know that like spencer seems to really be like pulling at here yeah and and to to the extent where uh she is then she's originally sentenced to um I think it's death. I have to double check that. But she's sentenced. And then he's like, all right, well, maybe not that. And he sentences her to save 23 souls for all of the souls, all of the men that she said no to that then died. Right. She has to save the same amount of souls. And that's her sentence. Um, and this is, this is so crazy to me uh, that even when it's brought to Arthur, Arthur's like, yeah, that checks out. Yeah. Arthur's this like benevolent figure, this Christ-like figure, and even Arthur's like, yeah, that makes sense. So Spencer is really saying something here to the point where he's like, she shouldn't have said no. Yeah. She shouldn't have been uh, stubborn. She shouldn't have been this sort of like uh, arrogant yeah. figure, which is really ironic coming from him. Um, but she shouldn't have done that because even Arthur thinks that her sentence is appropriate. Yeah. Uh, which is absolutely mind boggling to me. Yeah. It really challenges like her role for sure within the text. And uh, Mirabella really stood strong to like the very end. Mm-hmm. Um, I have this quote from the text here. Um, there it is. So it's, 
He which doth summons lovers to lovers judgment hall, the damsel was attached and shortly brought unto the bar, whereas she was arraigned. But she thereto uh, not plead nor answer aught, even for stubborn pride, which her restrained. So judgment passed as is by law ordained in cases like which when at last she saw her stubborn heart, which love before disdain came stoop and falling down with humble awe, cried mercy to abate the extremit, extremity of law. Uh, so that, that quote there uh, shows that Mirabella was really just a hard ass until, until a very end, until she was sentenced. Yeah. Um, and I respect that. I respect that because she was really just standing up for herself. Even though she was a little arrogant, that's no, you know, that's, that's no real crime committed, yeah. at least by today's standards. Right. Um, you want to talk about Mirabella some more, or can, do you want to move on? No, I mean, like, if you want to... Because I have some things to say about Amaret. About Amaret. Amaret. So, Amaret. Um, we, so, there are a lot of sad characters in the Fairy Queen, right? For there, sure. There's a lot of, like, sort of, like, oh, I feel bad for them kind of characters. Amaret tops that list for me. Because Amaret, you know, we talk about how Mirabella didn't really do anything. Right. Amaret did nothing wrong. <laughs> I feel so bad. Uh, Amaret, and I, I mentioned this earlier, so Scudamore, her fiancé, just took her. Yeah. Just took her. Yeah. And, like... Just robbed her. Robbed her. <laughs> she was like, I don't want to leave the Temple of Venus. Why are you taking me? And he yeah. was like, I don't care. Shut up. Get, get out of here. And then, and then he lost her. That same night, he lost her to, to abuse her reign. And what did Buserain do? Uh, Buserain. Uh, did he rape her? Did he not rape her? I think he raped her. Um, but it's not, you know. It's, Bus- not, it's not explicitly, explicitly said. Out, but yeah. uh, but uh, Lordy B, was she tormented? Yeah. She was tormented. So, um, she's almost raped, but like probably raped and eaten alive uh, by Buserain. And then, uh, much worse, she's tied to this pillar and her chest is pierced by a long spear-like pen while her heart is then taken out and her blood is used as ink. I, I would like to mention another phallic object, taking yeah. the life, taking the power of a woman. Right. Um, I don't think that should go unnoticed. This spear-like pen is like taking the heart and blood out of uh, Amaret for no good reason. She was just yeah. living her life in the House of Venus, and they were like, nope, we're done. So, uh, even the narrator was like, ah, this isn't cool. Yeah. Um, and the, the quote specifically is, ah, who can love the worker of her smart? Which, from what I've read, a lot of people, up until genuinely, like, the 90s, yeah. were, like, victim-blaming Amaret, basically. Yeah. And said she was the worker of her smart. But, but God, look, come on. Let's, let's not be ridiculous here. Right. Buserain stole this stolen girl and then almost raped her and then like tried to eat her and then like stabbed her in the heart and used yeah. her blood. Like, so Buserain is the worker of Amaret's smart. Uh, this is absolutely an instance of violence against women. Uh, the cruel dart yeah. used. Is it a penis? I, I would say so. Maybe. I would say so. Probably. Probably. Can like? Can we say for sure? No. No. I, you know. Can we heavily infer? Sure. Sure. In <laughs> and, and, and my next life, I'm be like Eddie, baby. <laughs> Cruel dart was a penis, right? Yeah. He's gonna be like, yeah, it was a penis. So, so there's that. Um, so, but there are also, there are other instances in the Fairy Queen where rape is either actually perpetrated or almost happens or insinuated. Uh, for example, Una. Remember Una? Yeah. Uh, Sansloy, who, with beastly sin, thought to have her defiled. What are we doing? What's happening? Uh, Serena, laid on a sacrificial altar by cannibals, and they picked out their favorite body parts with, quote-unquote, lustful fantasies. Now, don't get me wrong, Michael. I have looked at a piece of steak, <laughs> and I have thought, mm, I want that steak. Right. But I've never been lustful for a piece of steak. So I have to imagine that these cannibals wanted to rape and then eat her, which is kind of gross. But like, when you think of 
people as objects or women as objects. It makes a little bit of sense. Um, and he, she had to be protected by like a priest of some sort, right. if I'm remembering correctly. So they would not rape her before they ate her. They, they picked out their, their choiciest parts. Um, oh, oh, my, my, my most mind blowing part of the whole book. And I mean this genuinely. Chrysogony, Chrysogon. Oh yeah, Chrysler Town and Country. <laughs> I don't, that one. She got pregnant from the sun. Pre- not S O N, S U N. Light and life giver was like baby. Like what? She didn't ask for that. She was laying. She was just enjoying the day. She yeah. wakes up, baby in her stomach, from the sun. It's like. In Spencer's world, there's nothing, there's no masculine energy that cannot take something feminine. Yeah. And I guess it, like, kind of makes you wonder then, you know, where, where is that boundary? And I guess it's, like, you know, because we were talking about Maribel and, like, just, like, the fact that she's saying no, right? It's just, like, where, where is the boundary yep. for this, like, authoritarian like masculineness to like overpower a being you know what i mean and it's like it's we've seen like consistently too just like it's almost like a theme of just like this invasion of women's like reproductive space Mm -hmm. is then used as just like this transition point within the narrative yep so like i i mentioned earlier it's just like this masculinity is grabbing like the reins of progression and just yanking it back and so is it that spencer i think spencer is really just critiquing like when we're when we're talking it's just like we're critiquing the way that gender roles like were drastically well not drastically but like were definitely pushed forward under elizabeth's reign and just this like this state in which you have characters who female characters who show this like power is like men consistently trying to take that power away yeah and in my opinion, the only successful knight out of the whole book would then be Britomart. Yeah. Because she displayed her, 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 like, power when she defeated um, Gaul. It seems like the only, the only time Spencer thinks a woman can be, can gain power is through, quote-unquote, legitimate power. Mm. So, a queen, a knight, you know, this sort of social upper class feeling that that's the only time a woman can a woman can have any power yeah. is if they are a, an upper class yeah but there's definitely this for women i feel like he's he's really pointing out too like there's this like line that they have to toe between like mm-hmm. power and obedience mm-hmm. you know what i mean Ma- is, traditionally masculine traditionally feminine energy yeah and which is why like i said like you know earlier that this that this text in itself is like uh like a critique of Elizabeth's reign, you mm-hmm. know, just during the 16th century. I mean, like there's there's an insane a, insane amount of women who are being beaten or raped or almost raped or eaten or just treated downright poorly. That right. I have to wonder again, how did Spencer really feel about women? And also because a lot of these women represented Elizabeth, how did Spencer really feel about Elizabeth? Right. If you know, if if he was going to to bend the knee, quote unquote, for her, um, then how far, you know, how far can he push the critique of her? Yeah. And it seems like he pushed it pretty far, but did it in a in a clever enough way where um, it may have gone unnoticed. Yeah. So Catherine Eggert's article, Spencer's Ravishment, uh, Rape, Rap, Rapture, and the Fairy Queen, mm-hmm. um, is like formulates an argument that is like that relies on uh, this concept. Uh, quote, poetry is most effective when it both, uh, one, portrays women being sexually assaulted, and two, describes its own operation 
as the phallic penetration and wounding of a defenseless and unwilling subject, uh, end quote. Um, so this is what we're here talking about is the fact that we have um, these characters that you've presented, like Amrit and Arabella, like these, like they're under attack, like they're defenseless. They have no like support, no power because they're being stripped of that power. Yeah. You know, so it's just kind of funny how um, she goes on to argue that the fairy queen supports this concept through Spencer's dull usage of the notion of ravishment and hints that the, po- that the, that the poem itself is a vehicle for rape. Yeah, I mean, there's, it's hard to argue against that. It's hard to argue against that because as, especially if you take these stories that we've just you know, posed in, at the end of this and you take them out of context, they're just really awful stories. Yeah. They're, I mean, they're well-written, sure, but they're really awful. And they're, it's something about the, this power dynamic that Spencer, that Spencer loves to tout that is uh, traditionally masculine will always win over traditionally feminine. And it's, it's, it, it kind of leaves you feeling a little skeevy. Mm-hmm. It, it's, it leaves a, a weird taste in your mouth because uh, you read scene after scene of, of women being taken or beaten or raped or eaten. And it's just not, um, it makes you wonder why. And it makes you wonder what is he saying? Um, and it, 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 I don't always love it, no. <laughs> to be honest with you. And it's kind of like, all right, well, that was the 16th century. You know, we can, we've moved past that. And, and, and granted, we have, uh, but there are people who today think similarly mm-hmm. to that. And that's a, a little troublesome, if I can be honest with you. Yeah, for sure. But I think Catherine and I would, uh, would get along. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, I mean, I would definitely argue, again, that, like, Spencer seems to be this more like not someone that's going to address like provide a solution to the problem Mm -hmm. but more or less like identify that there is this problem and you know and it's all through like flattering the queen right to get his his status to advance like like we said he wants to be the next you know great poet of england he wants to have that power status you know what i mean because it would just elevate him and then uh his ability to then like affect society so it's sort of an act of social protest literature while also uh excelling his career yeah for sure um so basically to like wrap up our conclusion of the special edition of Legends of the Stoop, um, Fairy Queen edition. Uh, <laughs> Academic <laughs> excellence. Yeah. Um, basically, uh, I feel like it's appropriate just to like, kind of like restate our, like our thesis statement to basically like wrap us up. Uh, so basically our th- thesis statement in, in an essence is like Spencer's depiction of violence uh and its relation to the female characters like involved in the scene and their reaction within the scene uh is juxtaposed to the gender roles of the 16th century england um which uh overall allude to spencer's like own thoughts and feelings of um the gender roles within 16th century england um so yeah that's like the premise of our argument um, I hope you guys enjoyed this special edition um, with my friend Anthony. Thank you very pleasure. much. I really pleasure. appreciate you having me. Let's, yeah. uh, let's do this again soon. And For sure. Let's, uh, let's talk about other stuff yeah. next time. <laughs> <laughs> Some, something a little bit less research. A little less research, a little more off the top of the head. Yeah. Maybe. A, little, a little more comfortable. Yeah. <laughs> that sounds good. That sounds good. All right. Thank you. Yep. Um, this is uh, your host, Mike Prince. Uh Thank you for stopping by the Stoop today. Make sure to check out our website at www.legendsofthestoop.com. 
uh, to check out all of our podcast episodes and the services that we provide. And don't forget to use the promo code uh, hashtag Stoop Legends in the checkout at Follow the Trees Ride the Vibe to receive discounts on all CBD products and merchandise. Damn. I like it. <laughs>